sorry, I want to record this. Okay, um, question number two, according to the Malthus, what's the relationship between economic growth and population growth? Malthus predicted that as population got bigger, standards of livings would fall, right? In other words, as population got bigger, our economic growth would fall. What was the assumption behind this? Malthus assumed that, that capital and technology were fixed. And so it was only a matter of how much land you had per person. And obviously that was a big mistake, is that production is a lot more than just land and people, but it's about physical capital, human capital and technology. And those are the things that, that Malthus forgot about. Okay, question number three. Um, India's per, current per capita uh, income is about 1500 bucks and they're growing at 7% a year. The U.S. is about six. U.S. is about forty-eight thousand, and it's growing at two percent a year. Um, okay, so sorry, trying to get my. Apologize for this funky's happening with my iPad here. So let's think about the U.S. and India here. U.S. is 48,000, India is 1,500, right? And so this question, India is growing at 7% a year. The U.S. is growing at 1% a year, 2%, sorry, 2%. So what's going to happen here? Well, I mean, there's a lot of ways that you could send, do this. A couple of people actually set this up as an algebra problem, which is, is fine. But um, usually, I, I mean, honestly, the way that I kind of just thought about it is here, here we are today. If the U.S. is growing at 2% a year, what does this mean? They will double every 35 years. Right? Because 70 divided by 2 is 35. So in other words, 35 years, they're going to be 96,000, 70 years, 192,000. What about India? If they're growing at 7% a year, they're doubling every 10 years. And so you can see the dramatic opportunity to catch up. Where are they going to be in 10 years? 3,000. Where are they going to be in 20 years? 6,000. 30, 12, 40, 24, 50, 48, 60, 96, 70. Whoa, look how nicely that worked out. In 70 years, India would be just as rich as the United States is. Okay? So th the purpose of this question is both to make sure you understand the concept of, of uh, the rule of 70, and see how it leads to dramatic opportunities for countries to catch up, right? For countries to catch up. Question number three says, define the concept of diminishing marginal returns. Some of us had a problem with this definition, right? And so this is in particular a definition you have to be very careful with. Because a number of you said things like, well, when, out, when capital goes up, output goes down. No, 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 no. That's not the case, right? It's not the case when, when capital goes up, output goes down. When capital goes up, output goes up. But it goes up at a diminishing rate, right? That's the key to diminishing marginal returns. So the definition of diminishing marginal returns is that as the quantity of capital increases, the change in output from a new unit of capital, from new, from new capital, decreases. Okay, so as the quantity of capital increases, the change in GDP or the change in output from new capital decreases. The key here is that it's not output that's changing, it's the change in output that's changing, if that makes sense. So it's not the level of output that's changing, 
or it's not the level of output that's falling, it's the change in output that is falling. All right, so is everybody uh, clear about that definition? Because I definitely got the sense, I, I was, um, was hoping that we would do better as a class on that one, right? We definitely had a few problems with that. That's the point of the quizzes, right? Make sure that we know what we think we know. Okay, question number five, return to the answers that to, I, I meant here, questions three and four. How might you use the concept of diminishing marginal returns to critique the prediction that you made in question three? Is India gonna grow at 7% a year for the next 70 years? No, because of diminishing marginal returns, right? India will see their growth slow, just like China is seeing its growth slow. And that's not a failure of China or in India, it's actually a symptom of success that as countries get richer, their growth will slow down. And that is a good thing. As we talked about in class, it is better to be rich and growing slow than to be poor and growing fast, right? <laughs> and so the goal is to be rich and growing slow, not the, not the goal to be poor and growing fast. Finally, question number six, what's meant by the race between technology and education? How is this concept used to explain why inequality is rising in the US? We're seeing skills-based technological change. In other words, new technology is very, very reliant upon human capital. It's human capital intensive. And so that has increased the premium to people who have an education. And unfortunately, the supply of educated workers is not keeping pace with the demand for educated workers. That's pushing up wage differences between high educated and lower educated workers. And that is contributing to inequality. All right, and we talked about that at great length in class on Wednesday. So, okay. Um, Overall, we, we did well on this quiz, right? Overall, there were, I didn't see any big problems. I think there were you know, a couple of problems here and there. You know, once again, one, one consistent problem I, I kind of see amongst us, and th this is not a surprise, is continue to work on using words clear and concise, right? The clarity of your language really matters, right? When you talk about a concept, can you really define what that concept is? And so, you know, for some of you, you know, I, I know you know, I guess, I guess maybe that's the thing. I, I know that you kind of understand the concept, but when it comes to really communicating it, um, I think sometimes th there's the bump in the road, right? There's the bump in the road that some of you still, you, you kind of know what we're talking about, but when it comes to really right down to explaining it, you know, it, it gets a little messy, it gets a little unclear. And so, you know, continue to work on that. It's a, it's a process, but I, I, overall, I thought we did pretty well on this quiz, so I was happy to see it. All right, well, what are we up to this morning? So I would like to start off the day by giving you guys a little gift. Um, it's a gift I like to give on Friday afternoons. It's a gift to you, but it's also, more importantly, a gift to me, <laughs> which is that we're not going to have class this afternoon. Okay, we're not gonna have class this afternoon. Yeah, exactly. Um, I would like to say that I'm gonna be sitting out in the sun uh, or going on a wild, crazy weekend, but no, I have a bunch of Zoom meetings this afternoon. And so, um, so we are not gonna have class. So we might go a little bit over 11 o'clock. Let's see, I really wanna finish up chapter 12. So we might go a little bit later this morning, but we won't have class this afternoon. So this will be a good time for you to uh, get a little rest and relaxation in and then get ready to maybe do a little bit of work over the weekend. And so um, today we're gonna talk about chapter 12, which is really where we began yesterday. So one of the things you can do this weekend is to spend some time reviewing what we talked about in chapter 12 yesterday and today. So listen, here's the good thing about today's lecture. In many ways, what we're talking about today is just building on what we talked about yesterday, right? So in other words, a lot of what we're gonna do today is review what we talked about yesterday and also talk about some examples of how we can use that aggregate demand, aggregate supply model to explain real world events. And so I'm quite optimistic that at the end of class today, 
not, there's a couple of things I'm op optimistic about. First off, you're gonna find today's class a lot more interesting than yesterday's class, right? Maybe that, that's too easy of a goal to achieve, right? <laughs> but I, I definitely think you're gonna find today's class a lot more engaging because we're gonna be talking about real recessions and how our model can actually help us understand real recessions like what happened in 2008 or what happened during the COVID crisis. So that's one good thing. But the other good thing is I think by using these models, we will understand a lot more of the mechanics of the model, right? Which is what we really talked about yesterday. And so, you know, it, I, I think by the end of class today, my hope is that we're all gonna feel a lot more confident about where we are with the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model. And if we don't, then this weekend is a good time to go back, spend a little bit of time extra, work a couple of extra problems, um, and, and you know, move forward so that we're ready to go on Monday, all right? And of course, on Monday, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to talk about this aggregate demand and aggregate supply model, right? Because that's actually gonna be a big theme of what we talk about next week. So we're gonna get a lot of practice using this, right? We're gonna get a lot of practice using this. So the big thing we wanna talk about today is using this aggregate demand, aggregate supply model to explain recessions. And I wanna talk about kind of two two different causes of recessions, because every recession, well, I, I shouldn't say every recession, but in general, we can think of recessions as really being driven by two causes. Most recessions have two original sins, right? Two original causes to them. The first and probably the most common kind of recession is what we'll call an aggregate demand driven recession. The aggregate demand driven recession. You could also think about this as a Keynesian recession. Why? Because this is really the kind of recession that Keynes thought was the most common and also the kind of recession that Keynes wanted to explain. Keynes thought that most recessions are caused by falls in aggregate demand. He thought the most, likely the, the most likely culprit was falls in confidence. That leads to falls in spending, such as falls in consumption, and most importantly, falls in investment. Keynes thought that investment was very, very sensitive to this idea of animal spirits. Okay, now listen, Cain, when Keynes talked about this, this wasn't like, Keynes was not like one of these, these guys, uh, maybe like myself, who sat down in his basement talking to people on Zoom and never getting out in the real world, right? Keynes was decidedly a real world person. In fact, Keynes was a self-made millionaire. How did he make his money? Speculating in financial markets. And so he said, based on his observations, that there is a lot of boom and bust mentality. And when that bust happens, people get scared. They stop spending, they stop spending on consumption, they stop spending on, on investment. And what we see is we see a big fall in aggregate demand. So let's think about how this works in our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. And here, I just kind of apologize. This is where having a board would be really nice because it would give us, or at least give me a little bit more room to kind of write here because this, this make, your, make your graph on your notes pretty big because this is gonna be a little bit more complicated. We're gonna have a number of things going on here. 
Oh, the whiteboard. How I miss you. I never thought I would say I miss whiteboards. <clears throat> All right, so here we are. Let's assume that we start kind of in our long run equilibrium, right? Here's our long run equilibrium. And what's true, as we talked about yesterday in the long run, that we're right here at the natural rate. We begin with output equal to the natural rate of output and the actual price level equal to the expected price level. Okay, so here we are at the beginning. We're kind of starting out in what we'll call our long run equilibrium. Okay, now we have this aggregate demand shock. Right, we have this aggregate demand shock. This loss, here I'll write it at the bottom. This decline in confidence in which aggregate demand falls. And our aggregate demand curve falls to the left. What happens? As the actual price level falls, we move along our short run aggregate supply curve out to this point. Okay, so output falls below the natural rate and the price level falls. Notice, as I said a second ago, output is below the natural rate. We are in a recession. Output's falling. And so Keynes thought that this was a very typical way that recessions happen. They're caused by loss of confidence, right? Psychology, the booms and busts of the market. People get scared during a recession. When they get scared, they stop spending. Households stop spending, firms stop spending on investment. In fact, Keynes, once again, Keynes thought that investment part was really the most important that firms really get scared because when they when you invest you're not just investing for tomorrow you're investing for 20 or 30 years right so one just a little bit of fear can really change firms investment strategies their investment plans and so aggregate demand falls and we slip into a recession right that part is pretty easy that that's that's kind of the i would say the easy part right <laughs> um of understanding is that yeah i think this hopefully this is pretty clear to us how a fall in aggregate demand could lead to a recession now here's the more complicated question how will this recession end Will we ever get back to the natural rate? The first option would be you could follow the prescriptions of the classical, op classical economists. One option is that you could just follow laissez-faire and let the markets work themselves out. 
okay? You let, could let the market work itself out. So let's go back to this graph here. What's true when we're down here, when we're at this point? Notice that there's something true, there's, there's something that's gone on here. The actual price level fell, but the expected price level is unchanged. Right? I don't want to give you all motion sickness flipping back and forth on my screen, but we see this here, right? That as we moved into recession, the price level fell, but nothing happened to the expected price level. This was unexpected. This was an unexpected fall in the price level. So what's gonna happen over time? Over time, people are gonna observe that this happened. The public is gonna increase, I'm sorry, no, not increase, typo. The public is going to decrease their expected price level and accept lower wages. Over time, people will observe this and the public will reduce their expected price level and accept lower wages. Why will they do that? Why is the public going to accept lower wages? Well, notice here what's happened. What happened as we moved along our short run aggregate supply curve? We had layoffs right? Firms laid workers off. They cut production and laid workers off because of this fall in aggregate demand. And so that is going to put downward pressure on wages. But this is a, in some sense, a good thing because lower wages do what to our short run aggregate supply? They increase short run aggregate supply. Lower wages increase short run aggregate supply. So let me redraw the graph because it's gotten a little cluttered. But let's walk through this one more time. So the first part is we had that fall in aggregate demand. And we slip into a recession where the actual price level is less than the expected price level, right? But then what's going to happen if we give markets enough time, what's going to happen? People are going to lower their expected price level and lower wages. This is going to shift our short run aggregate supply. Because if you remember, these, that's one of the things that shifted short run aggregate supply. It will shift short run aggregate supply to the right. And what's it going to do? it's going to move us back towards the natural weight. So we go through this big cycle. You can see why economists call this business cycles, right? You have a recession and then a recovery, right? A recession and then a recovery. How does this recovery process work? It works because people adjust 
their expected price level and they adjust their wages. And so the market will figure itself out. The market will figure itself out. People will catch on to what's going on. And as they catch on, they'll adjust their expected price level and they'll adjust their wages. Now, can you see what's, can you think of any problem or criticism of this approach? talked about getting stuck a little bit maybe yeah getting stuck right getting stuck do you get a sense that Keynes thought that this process would take place very quickly no right because of efficiency wages and wage contracts and lack of information and you know, all our biases and our irrationality, Keynes did not think this process would take place fast. He thought it would take too long. How long will it take for people to get new information and adjust their wages and prices? A long time. So this leads to one of the more uh, famous quotes in economics, right? Where Keynes was one at once asked about this process, well, you know, why, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself in the story, but we're going to see that Keynes is going to argue for a much more active government response to a recession. And so a reporter asked Keynes, well, why, why do we need a government response? Won't markets just work themselves out in the long run? And Keynes's response to that was, well, in the long run, we're all dead. right? In the long run, we're all dead. Meaning you cannot just live your life waiting around for the long run because you will essentially wait your entire lives, right? The long run is a theoretical construct, but we don't live our life in the long run. We live our life in the short run and we cannot waste time. We cannot waste, you know, op or output, uh, possibilities. We cannot waste people's lives by just waiting around for this process to work. And so Keynes was a big critic of this. And he was very critical of the classical approach. Now, of course, the classical the classical belief is one that markets work efficiently. and that this market adjustment process takes place quickly. that the government, of course, is more likely to screw things up as opposed to getting them right. That would be kind of the, the classical belief on this. And so you can see you have two different perspectives here, the Keynesian or the more liberal, right, politically liberal um, approach toward dealing with re recessions. We're gonna talk more about that here in a second or this classical belief, right? That markets work efficiently. So what is the, the Keynesian option? The Keynesian option is Keynesian stabilization policy. 
The approach is to use government policy to increase aggregate demand and move output back to the natural rate. So don't wait around for this whole long involved process to work. You jump in and do something right now, right? Jump in and do something right now. So here's our graph again. Oops. Here's our graph again. So remember, we had a recession. Aggregate demand falls. Okay. What should the government do? Stabilization policy, right? Stabilization policy means stabilize output by increasing aggregate demand. And what they want to do here is you want to increase aggregate demand so that output moves right back to the natural rate and the price level goes up. What are the tools that the government could do to use to? could use to, to achieve this? Help me out. How could the government try to increase aggregate demand? What could they do? Because we, we talked about three, three ways that government can impact aggregate demand yesterday. So what are those three ways that the government could most directly impact aggregate demand? They could spend a bunch of money on different programs and things. Right. It could use government spending. If they spend more, they can stimulate aggregate demand. What's the other tool they have to increase aggregate demand? Could they lower interest rates? Yes, they could use particularly monetary policy. And this is what we're going to talk about on Monday. Okay, on Monday, we're going to kind of come back and fill in the details of this, but we're going to talk about how monetary policy could be used to increase aggregate demand by cutting interest rates. All right, so, you know, Monday. <laughs> we'll talk more about the details of this. And what's the third way? What do you think, Logan L? There's spending, there's, mon there's monetary policy, there's spending, and then there's also, what's the flip side of spending? Um, uh, saving or investments? No, so we're talking about the government, right? Uh -huh. So they can spend, how can they pay for their money or pay for their spending? Um, taxes. They taxes, right? And here, if you wanted to increase aggregate demand, you could cut taxes. Did you really put the scroll back up to right above the graph? Thank you. So the government has these three tools. If I can just scroll up a little bit to see the graph. When aggregate demand falls during a recession, then what should the government response be to push it back up? What are the three tools that they have to push it back up? 
They have the tool of government spending, they have the tool of taxes, and they have the tool of monetary policy. Okay, and so Keynes thought they should use these tools to, to stabilize output. And that's why we call this Keynesian stabilization policy, right? What are we trying to stabilize output around? The natural rate, right? We're trying to keep output at that natural rate. Of these three tools, which do you think Keynes thought was the most important or the most powerful? Any guesses? Spending? Government spending, good guess. Why do you think Keynes thought that this was the one that had the most power? Anybody have any ideas? Because then you can employ people that were previously not employed, or maybe like a work program or something, and then they spend that money. And right. Employed now. So yeah. So as we're going to see here in a second, um, Keynes was definitely, in many ways, the intellectual father of the New Deal. <laughs> Right, so a lot of the New Deal policies um, very nicely fit into this Keynesian way of thinking. But I, I think there's a little bit more to it, Logan. It is true that Keynes thought that government could create jobs. But the reason why he thought government was better for this is because he was really skeptical that two or three would create jobs during a recession. Why? it all gets back to psychology. People are scared. They won't spend their tax cut. They'll stick it in the, under their mattress. Keynes worried that they won't borrow even if interest rates are low. that if, if businesses and firms are scared, it doesn't make any difference what interest rates are. They're not gonna borrow. So what's the solution? Have the government spend the money. Because what will the government do? They will spend it. They will spend it well, I mean, this sounds like a bit of a radical idea, but Keynes said at some level, it doesn't even matter if you hire people to dig holes in the ground and fill them back in. As long as you are hiring people and giving them jobs and giving some, them some sense of security, if you do that for enough people, their psychology will stabilize, they'll start spending again, and the economy will get better, right? Now, obviously, Keynes did not want people to actually dig holes and fill them in. We can do more productive things with labor. But Keynes's point is, you know, kind of regardless of what you have people do, the key is to get, to kind of solidify people's confidence, right? Give them jobs, give them something to do, give them a stable source of income, then the fear will dissipate and aggregate demand will, will stabilize. So, Keynes was a big fan of government spending, right? He, he thought that government spending was actually the most powerful tool that governments could use during a recession. Um, and so we're going to talk about the Great Depression here in a minute, but you, know, you won't be surprised that, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of the New Deal policies of Franklin Roosevelt were actually closely related to some of these ideas of Keynes. Of course, you know, as we're going to talk about more here over the next few days, there is a classical critique of this, right? Classical economists disagree with Keynes. And we're going to talk about these all in more detail next week as we talk more about government policy. But do policymakers know enough to do this right? 
do policymakers always know enough to do this right? Listen, it's one thing for me to be doing this up here on my iPad. It's another thing to be doing this out in the real world, right? This all looks really easy on my iPad, but what happens when you try to put this in the place in the real world where it's messy? Um, policymakers may not know what they're doing and they might make mistakes. And we're actually gonna talk about some exa examples later, later today in which policymakers have made some big mistakes in trying to combat recessions. There's also this question of debt, right? What happens if you go to the well too often? If you start spending more, you start spending more and you don't collect enough taxes, you could have debt. And as we're gonna talk about next week, government debt, particularly government debt here, but also personal debt could threaten this whole system for reasons that we're gonna talk about. And then many classical economists worry that this pushes up inflation. Because if I can just scroll up to our question, our, our graph here, what are we doing whenever the government gets involved in stimulating output? We're pushing up inflation, right? And so there's this worry among many classical economists that when you start increasing aggregate demand, it gets too easy to do that. And what is the long-term consequence of that? It's going to be more inflation. So we will, we will talk about this more. Um, we will definitely talk about this more next week. All right. We're going to talk about actually most of all this stuff we're going to talk about more next week. But we will kind of go back and, and talk about this, this, this kind of back and forth between classical economists and Keynes, right? Keynes believed in a more active government role. He believes that you just can't wait around for the economy to solve itself. But classical economists say, well, you know, you have too much hubris. You're smarter than you think you are. And there are a lot of unintended consequences of trying to do this, such as accumulating debt over time or possibly pushing up inflation. So with all this in mind, right, we'll kind of call that all the background stuff. Let's, let's talk about some examples of aggregate demand-driven recessions. Let's talk a little bit about the Great Depression. because obviously this was probably the biggest economic catastrophe in US history. How can our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model help us understand what was going on? Well, I think economists are pretty much in agreement. That the Great Depression was caused by a series of falls in aggregate demand. So aggregate demand fell for, num for a number of reasons, not just for one reason, but for a number of, mum, not with her, sorry, my tongue is tied, for a number of reasons. First, something that most of us are familiar with, the financial crisis. about one third of all banks failed in the United States during the Great Depression. And this was an age before deposit insurance. So if you had your money in a bank and that bank failed, what happened to your money? It's gone, right? There is no deposit insurance, there is no backup. This played a huge role in destroying a lot of wealth, not just of banks, but of individuals. Likewise, the stock market crash. 
Now, people were not nearly as heavily invested in the stock market back in 1929 as they are today. Um, in fact, you know, if you think about this, while the stock market crash reduced wealth too, as a practical matter, it didn't have nearly the impact of wealth that the bank failures did. So he, yet here's another, here's another reason why a lot of what you learn about economic history is just simply wrong. I'm sure that most of you were taught that the 1929 or the Great Depression was caused by the stock market crash. No, it was not caused by the stock market crash. We have had stock market crashes much bigger than the one that happened in October in 29 after the Great Depression, right? We've had bigger ones in the 1980s, the 1990s, the 2000s. We've never had anything like the Great Depression since. So this idea that the stock market crash caused the Great Depression, it just, it doesn't, caught, it doesn't pass the smell test. It, it is, honestly, it's probably more of a symptom of a bigger problem, which was just a complete bust and a loss of confidence. In other words, this was a psychological depression where people got extremely scared, extremely scared, and they just stopped spending money particularly as the financial crisis picked up, there was probably a vicious circle here. And in some sense, I should, if I can draw this, this arrow going both ways means that the loss in confidence made the bank crisis worse, and then the bank crisis made the loss in confidence worse, right? I mean, this is a vicious circle. This is a vicious circle between the two. And that certainly happened in the 1930s, the early 1930s. There were a few other things that, that happened. Um, most of you are familiar with the farm disaster, the, dis the Dust Bowl, that destroyed a great deal of wealth as the farm economy in parts of the United States essentially collapsed. Today we know that when things get bad, a central bank like the Federal Reserve should lower interest rates. What did the Federal Reserve do? They raised interest rates. Why? We'll talk about this a little bit on Monday, but it was the dastardly power of the gold standard. One of the uniquely bad ideas in, in economic history. And so I, we'll, we'll talk more about this on Monday, right? But the gold standard really forced the Fed to do the opposite of what we now know was, you know, the right thing to do. Likewise, what did the federal government do in fiscal policy? Today, right, during the COVID crisis, we had, we've had both Republican and Democratic presidents who've tried to cut governments, I'm sorry, tried to cut taxes and raise government spending. What did Hoover do? He cut spending and he raised taxes. Why? I mean, <laughs> bad economics, right? Bad economics. Hoover was very worried about balancing the budget. And so as the economy got weaker, Hoover became more obsessed with balancing the budget, cutting spending and raising taxes. Today, we know that this is exactly wrong, right? Which goes to show you that, you know, as we're gonna see, a lot of what caused the Great Depression was just simply bad macro management. Hopefully mistakes that we won't repeat in any future crises, though there's no promises. This is all what happened between basically 1929 and 1932.
which is in many ways the, the worst of the recession or the depression. And so you have to think about the, depre the depression as just this series of falls in aggregate demand. In some sense, cycling back on each other, right? That one fall is aggregate demand causes more of a loss in confidence, which leads to another fall in aggregate demand. And so what happens to prices? You had a question on your, uh, what was it, your second exam. That the price level fell by about 25% during the Great Depression. And what happened to output? It fell by about 50% during the Great Depression. All right. So pretty bad outcome, right? I think we can all agree upon that. A pretty bad outcome. So this was like also after the depression got over, they had a pretty like slow recovery, didn't they? There was, a, right, there were, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that here in a second, um, Zach. So yeah, hold on to that thought and then we'll come back and, and cycle back to this that in a second because before we get to that, I think we need to talk about the New Deal. And so Roosevelt gets elected president. And uh, he comes in and he passes a series of reforms. Um, when you think of the New Deal, what do you think of? What's what's when you think about policies associated with the New Deal, what's what's the thing that comes that most comes to mind? What do you think, Bryn? What's what's probably the policy that most comes to your mind? I'm gonna say I don't know a lot about the New Deal, but I know it created a lot of jobs or tried to. Tried to, and and how did it try to create the, the jobs? Did it just leave it to the private sector? Um, didn't governments try and create like road work kind of jobs? Like, uh, movement? Yeah, right. A big increase in government spending, particularly on things like infrastructure. Right, if you drive around here in Iowa, I don't know how many of you are from Iowa or from outside, but. It, when you drive through small towns in Iowa, it's actually just kind of interesting to go and look at the courthouse, right? And around here, almost every single courthouse was built around 1932, 1933, 1934, the big years of the New Deal, right? And so that kind of big infrastructure spending is where a lot of today's infrastructure still dates to, right? Particularly in terms of things like courthouses and schools and roads, right? Our, our, you know, a lot of our interstate system was kind of set up during <laughs> the New Deal. And, you know, th this is just classic, this is classic Keynesian economics. There's a couple of other things, though, that were really important parts of the New Deal that, that you should be familiar with. Um, one of them was we got off the gold standard. and we reformed the Federal Reserve. We'll talk about this on Monday, but the Federal Reserve and monetary policy played a big role in creating the Great Depression, and the New Deal played a big role in ending the Great Depression by stopping bad Federal Reserve policy. Another important part of the New Deal, actually there's many parts of the New Deal. I, I, I shouldn't say these are the only parts, but from our perspective, a couple of, of, of parts of the New Deal that we want, to, we want to highlight is the creation of bank deposit insurance. The FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Who is the insurance for, the bank or the depositor? Uh, 
Who gets insured? What do you think, Gabe? Who gets insured under under bank deposit insurance? Um, that would it be the banks? Can banks go out of business today? Yep. Right, banks can go out. Who gets insured? Depositors. Right. Bank deposit insurance is insurance for depositors so that they will not lose all of their wealth if a bank goes bankrupt, right? So this is essentially a, a creation of a safety net for depositors to create, you know, confidence. And really, I, I, that's the key word here. Yes. The New Deal increased aggregate demand. Some of it was through increase in spending, but a lot of it was trying to increase confidence. And for any of you who are kind of amateur historians, you, you read a lot about FDR. Um, one of the reasons why FDR was uniquely poised to be a successful president at this period of time was because everybody said, that FDR was one of the most optimistic and confident people that they'd ever met, right? <laughs> and so he, in, in many ways, right, as much about the New Deal as it was about, you know, these infrastructure programs and the gold standard and all this, it was about a sense of doing something, right? It was about a, a sense of doing something and restoring confidence and trying to deal with the damaged psycho psychology right, in the psyche of many Americans. Did the New Deal end the Great Depression? Well, this is your question, Zach, and I think you know the answer. It didn't really, right? It didn't really, but it did stop the bleeding, right? It did stop the bleeding. So if I can show you a picture here, oops. Here's looking at the unemployment rate, which is the orange line. And then the, the purple line or the purplish red line is our budget deficit. Basically meaning how much we were spending above what we were taking in as in taxes. And so look here what happened during the New Deal in the early 1930s, right? Up to like 1933. Notice that our budget deficit went up and the government was spending more money. But the unemployment rate only went down very, very slowly. And I think to most economists, most economists, I, I think if, if they were to explain this, they would just simply say the New Deal wasn't big enough, right? Relative to the size of the whole, the New Deal only, only just barely started filling the hole back in. Right, that something actually much more aggressive was likely needed than the, than the New Deal. And so while the New Deal kind of stopped the bleeding and it did reduce an unemployment, you'll notice here that unemployment was still above 10% all the way out to 1941. So the economy recovered very, very slowly. And you also know that a lot of the New Deal spending kind of disappeared in the 1937, 38. So the new, the new Deal, it helped, but it didn't end the problem. When did we actually get unemployment down around 5% again? In the war buildup, right? And that's when we began to see huge increases in aggregate demand, right? That green era area where we started spending more for the war. And so in many ways, um, the U.S. didn't become Keynesian until we started getting serious about fighting World War II. That's when we saw some really significant increases in government spending and some really increases in increase, significant increases in aggregate demand, and finally some significant falls in unemployment. But, you know, um, one of the things that I think we see here is that this Keynesian idea, this Keynesian aggregate demand story, actually fits the data pretty well. 
right? I think it's, it's a persuasive explanation about what happened during the Great Depression. So why don't we take a break here uh, for five minutes, and then I want to come back and talk about the global financial crisis of 2008 and maybe compare and contrast this a little bit with the Great Depression and kind of think about, well, how is it the same or how is it different, okay? So let's, let's take maybe about five minutes or so, and then I'll meet, we'll meet back here and talk about um, another crisis, right? We're nothing but crisis. All right, everybody. <clears throat> Back to the Zoom minds. No rest, no rest, no rest. And now we're getting, we're getting into the last hour or so of class, right? It's like the last five miles of a marathon, right? It's still a long way, but... <laughs> <laughs> you feel like you can almost see the finish line. So yeah, been a busy week as, as I probably all of the, the weeks are under the block plan. Okay, so let's talk about the global financial crisis of 2008. And what I want to do here is talk about the crisis, but also in many ways compare and contrast it with the Great Depression. In what ways was it similar and in what ways was it different? And I think the, the similarities and the differences between what happened in 2008 and what happened in 1929 are, are really illustrative for us in terms of thinking about recessions and depressions. Once again, economists really strongly believe that this was an aggregate demand-driven recession. Right? What were some of these things that shifted down aggregate demand? the incredible losses in wealth from the housing crash and the mortgage-backed security. Bond market crash. We talked about mortgage-backed securities last Friday. And so I don't want to say, I don't want to repeat myself from what I said last Friday, but just to remind you that these mortgage-backed securities were basically bonds that were backed with mortgages. And so during the boom, everybody was able to get a mortgage. And the supply of these bonds in the markets boomed. And it drove up housing prices as everybody was going to get a mortgage so everybody could buy a house. But what happened when many people who owned houses started to default on their mortgages because they could not pay the money back? Well, when they couldn't pay the money back, then the bonds started to default. And when the bonds started to default, then nobody could get a mortgage. And when nobody could get a mortgage, nobody could buy a house. So were people, were people, oh, oh sorry. That's, right. that's right, I'll just finish it. So there was the boom on the way up, where more mortgages led to more bonds, led to more house buying. And then there is the bust on the way down where people start to default, right? Uh, as a result, some of these bonds default. When the bonds default, nobody wants to buy the bonds, so nobody can get a mortgage, so nobody can buy a house, right? That is, that is one aspect of the story. Now, I will say the story is a very complicated one. Um, in that, you know, some of this, some of this was driven by the subprime market in the sense that there were people who bought houses that probably did not have the financial wherewithal to do that. But there was also a lot of outright corruption, right? And, and many people were sold mortgages that were, were worse than the ones that they could have qualified for. 
right? Many people who bought these subprime mortgages actually could have qualified for a regular mortgage, but they were sold these subprimes by, you know, I, I would say basically not very uh, ethical <laughs> banks and loan operators. And so this whole mar market was largely deregulated and there was a lot of shady behavior going on. So some of it was just, you know, maybe people who didn't have the, the wherewithal to buy a house, buying houses. And I think that's the story that many Americans were sold is just like, well, these people should never bought a house in the first place. Well, there were some of those people, but there was also a lot of shady behavior going on here. And so it fueled the bus, the boom on the way up and the bust on the way down. Yeah, Zach, what, what were you saying? Um, yeah, so like, since it was like very easy to get mortgages and stuff, did that lead to people buying like, like, you know, people working at the gas station buying like, you know, 500,000 or like million dollar homes, like more expensive than they could afford. And then that's what led to everything or? Well, you know, I, I think as in most things, it's yes, there were examples of that, right? There were examples of that. But I think it's too strong to say that's the only thing that happened, right? So let me, let me back up here. If, if any of you have watched any movies about this, have you seen a movie like The Big Short, right? which is really a great movie. Um, I highly recommend this movie. It's funny. It's interesting. It, it's a great movie. The story they tell that, they, that Hollywood and often many of the financial papers want to tell is of basically malfeasance, right? Of, of, of people who should have never bought a house and they went out and they bought mansions. Are there examples of that? Yes. But there are also just as many examples of, and I'm going to pick this specific example because this, we know that this happened, that working class black families who could have qualified for a regular mortgage, a 20 year fixed rate mortgage, were sold mortgages in which that had adjustable rates in them. And these adjustable rates had interest rates that would stay low for three or four years and then double or triple after that. These mortgages were essentially taking advantage of people who may not have had the financial um, wherewithal or the, the, the financial savvy to kind of realize what they were being sold. These mortgages in many ways were designed to fail. And many people failed on houses that they'd lived in for 20 years, okay? So it's, it's not just a case of people taking money and buying a big mansion. Yes, that did happen, unfortunately. But it was also a case of many people being sold smaller homes or refinancing homes they've lived in for a long period of time, but being sold a mortgage that was explicitly discriminatory. And, and, and there has been some good evidence that a lot of this was, was racially discriminatory, right? Is that they, they were, these, these, these mortgages were specifically targeted to people in disadvantaged groups because Quite honestly, they may not have be, be as savvy. Um, and, you know, listen, I'm, I'm saying this as an, an economics PhD, right? A PhD with economics. I've had at least eight mortgages in my life, and I've never read one of them. Okay? <laughs> I mean, these things are like 50 pages, right? So you kind of trust that you're being sold something that you know, that is in your interest. And, and clearly many times it wasn't. So it, it's, it's a complicated story, right? It is a complicated story. And yeah, there were, there were some people who bought houses that shouldn't have, but there were also people who were sold mortgages that they had no idea what they were buying, right? And they, and they were definitely taken advantage of. But for our purposes, the big thing to, to at least hear, given this topic, is to understand the ways that this created a lot of wealth and then wiped all that wealth out. And that obviously played a big role in reducing aggregate demand. Then there was the collapse in consumer confidence. That was associated with the financial crisis. There was a point during this crisis when Basically, hardly anybody could get a loan. It became extremely difficult for even people with the highest amounts of credit to qualify for a loan. 
So all of this together was just this incredible series of falls in aggregate demand. Right, the incredible series of falls in aggregate demand. However, one of the things that we observe is that while there's many particulars of the 2008 crisis that remind you of the Great Depression, the 2008 crisis was not nearly as bad as the recession. I'm, I'm sorry, not nearly as bad as the Great Depression. So look at this figure. <clears throat> The bottom line, the line that's a little bit more purplish, is the Great Depression, looking at what happened to output during the Great Depression. And the horizontal axis is the months since the peak. So basically, after each of these recessions started, what happened to output in the following months? And you can see the Great Depression, output just starts falling and falling and falling, and it falls for 39 months, right? and it falls by 40 to 50 percent. But what happened during the 2008 crisis, which is the orange line? Output started falling really quickly for about a year, but then there was a little bit of a recovery. Now the recovery was very slow, but there was a recovery. It wasn't like the Great Depression where output just kept on falling and falling and falling. And so why the difference? Why wasn't the 2008 crisis as bad as the Great Depression? Well, I think there's, a, a, I think economists in general have a pretty simple response to that. The government's policy response. Basically, the government acted like a Keynesian. Right, the government acted like the Keynesian. It followed the prescription that Keynes would have suggested. It engaged in a lot of stabilization policy. And once again, it's not just liberals that are doing this, it tends to be Republicans too, right? <laughs> so the 2008 crisis actually started when George Bush, a Republican, was president. What's the first thing that Bush did? Passed a series of tax cuts. And Obama did the same thing. Then Obama, um, passed a stimulus package that was 50% cutting taxes and 50% increasing government spending. The Fed aggressively lowered interest rates, just like we know that they're supposed to do. And then maybe most importantly was this passage of what, of what is now known as TARP, the Treasury Asset Relief Program. Otherwise known as bank bailouts, where the government gave loans to all banks, whether they were struggling or not, the, the government basically made them take loans. Does anybody like to see big, rich bankers who caused this crisis get a bailout? Nobody likes to see that. Why then did the government bail out these banks? So they could, they wouldn't default and then they could lend money again? Right, 
I mean, it's a, it was a very pragmatic decision that if all these banks default, they will all go under and our financial system will be wrecked. And it's gonna be very difficult for us to recover. So what do we do? We give them a bailout and we let them survive. Now, I do wanna be clear about this. In the end, this bailout did not cost very much. The US government in the end got about 100% of this money back. Banks did repay the government. Okay, so there is, there is this, this perception out there that somehow the government just gave away a trillion dollars to banks. No, they lent them a trillion dollars, right? They lent them a trillion dollars. And the, 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 in fact, for some of these, the, the, the US government got a very nice, tidy little profit. But, you know, it doesn't look good. <laughs> it doesn't look good. And, and, and if, if you go back and you read a history about this, one of the most unfortunate things about this was that as soon as these banks got the bailout, what was the first thing the CEOs did? They paid themselves big bonuses and like, you know, good job. Well, of course, the optics of that looked horrible, right? The optics of that looked horrible. Um, and so, you know, as people in the Obama administration have said many times, the problem with TARP is that in saving the economy, they lost the public, right? And I think that's a good description of what went on. They might have saved the economy, but they lost the public in terms of the politics and the optics of the whole thing. So when you put this all together, this played a big role in stabilizing aggregate demand. and it reduced the size of the fall in output. Not perfectly, but somewhat. But let's go back to this classical conservative critique. Because many conservatives, many classical economists are still critics of a lot of this that happened in 2008, a lot of the government's response. They worry about all the debt that was accumulated, right? Like all these stimuluses, all the tax cuts, right? We'll talk more about, I keep on saying this, we're gonna talk more about debt next week, but they worry about all this debt that's accumulated. They, they worried about inflation. Now that never came about, but they worry that all this spending would lead to inflation. One last thing that conservatives or classical economists, not, not just them, right? Because I think all economists, everybody should worry about this, but I think maybe classical or conservative economists worry about this more, is what economists know as moral hazard or referred to as moral hazard. Which is a pretty simple idea. If you reward bad behavior, you are incentivizing more of it. And so what do conservatives worry, particularly in terms of this bank bailout? Well, what's the lesson that the banks learn? That they can do whatever they want and they essentially have the economy held hostage, right? <laughs> and so how's that gonna change their behavior? If anything, it's gonna make it worse. Now, there have been reforms enacted in the US U.S. financial system that have tried to, to stop this, right? Many regulation, many reforms. This is not the class to get into all the details. Um, if you take money and banking with me, we'll talk a lot 
about the aftermath of the 2008 crisis. Um, so, so, so government has taken some actions to hopefully prevent some of this happening again, but you never know, right? You never know. And, and that, is a, that is a worry, right, about this kind of behavior is that, yeah, when in, in the interest of trying to save the economy, you also might incentivize bad behavior, right? You might incentivize bad behavior. Okay, we don't watch many videos in this class, but let's try it, at least this once, let's try it. I, I wanna show you a video here because we've been talking about this, the, the um, kind of the ideological debate between conservatives and liberals and between Keynes and the classical economists. And so one of the more famous classical economists is, is a um, guy by the name of Thomas Hayek, who in his time was, was basically a, um, a companion of Keynes, right, or a contemporary of Keynes. And in many ways, he was Keynes' intellectual foil, right? If Keynes was kind of the liberal activist, Hayek was more of the conservative skeptic, right, <laughs> about the role of government. And so, um, you know, I actually, for those of you who, who are interested in reading more, um, of course, Keynes is famous for his general theory. Which, listen, just between you and me is pretty unreadable. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not the most readable book in the world, I'll have to say. Right. I mean, it's it's it, not that it's technical. If you look in it, you'll see that there's hardly any equations. Very. I don't think there's any graphs. But just Keynes's is discussion. I would say is is very dense. Um, Hayek is kind of famous for this book, which is actually much more readable. And in, in, in fact, a book I would recommend to anybody, liberal or conservative, about the dangers of government, called The Road to Serfdom which is actually, as I said, a much more readable book in many ways. More, maybe more ideological, but more readable book. And in this book, without getting into the details here, um, Kayak talks about his skepticism about government management of the economy. He's just not so sure that a couple of people sitting at a desk in Washington know more than the market, okay? So anyway, this is a debate that's, that's long lasted in economics. Um, there were a couple of guys a few years ago who actually thought it would be fun to put together a rap video with, that involves one of them playing Keynes and one of them playing Hayek, all right? I know, it's kind of a cheesy idea. But it's kind of, I think it's kind of a cute, I, cute video. And listen, we don't watch videos in here, all right? So if we ever are going to watch a video, this is my only idea for watching a video. So we're going to do it, okay? So anyway, um, hopefully you turn up your sound. I think that this will work. Um, let me know if it doesn't. Once again, I'm, I'm Twittering the guy that the Browns drafted last night, sorry. Oh, where's my video? Here it is. All right, here we go. Let me know if you can't hear. Lord Keynes, welcome, sir. It's a pleasure. The pleasure's all mine. Your agenda. That won't be necessary. I am the agenda. <laughs> tell them I've arrived. And then tell them I've arrived. And your name is? Hayek. F.A. Hayek. 
Freddie. Hey, listen, party at the Fed. 20 minutes. Lobby. John Maynard Keynes. Uh, F.A. Hayek. Yeah, yeah, we're opposed. We oppose each other philosophically in the same studio. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. Blame low interest nah, rates. It's the animal spirit. John Maynard Keynes wrote the book on modern macro. The man you need when the economy's off track. Whoa. Depression, recession, now your question's in session. Have a seat and I'll school you in one simple lesson. The big wrench. We didn't bounce back. Economies in the trench. Persistent unemployment, the result of sticky wages. Waiting for recovery. That's outrageous. I had a real plan. Any fool can understand. The advice real simple. Who's aggregate demand? C I D all together gets to Y. Keep that total flow and watch the economy fly. Keep it going back. For a century, I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle, and good reason to fear it. Play more interest no. rates. It's the animal spirit. You see, it's all about spending. Hear the register cha ching. Circular flow, the dough is everything. So if that flow is getting low, doesn't matter the reason. We need more government spending. Now it's stimulus season, so forget about saving. Get it straight out of your head. Like I said, in the long run, we're all dead. Savings is destruction, that's the paradox of thrift. Don't keep money in your pocket or that growth will never live. Because business is driven by the animal spirits, the bull and the bear. And there's reasons to fear its effects on capital investment, income, and growth. That's why the state should build a gap with stimulus, both the monetary and the fiscal. They're equally correct. Digging ditches, war has the same effect. Last man, have some wealth, the multiplier, driving higher the economy's health. And if the central bank's interest rate policy tanks, a liquidity trap, that new money stuck in the banks. Deficits could be the cure you've been looking for. Let the spending soar, now that you know the score. My general theory's made quite an impression. Revolution. I transformed the econ profession. You know me, modesty, still I'm taking a bow. So say it loud and say it proud, we're all Keynesians now. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer. Markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. I made my case, Freddie H. Listen up, can you hear it? I'll begin in broad strokes, just like my friend Keynes. His theory conceals the mechanics to change. That simple equation, too much aggregation, ignores human action and motivation. Keynes has a justification for bailouts, payoffs, by polls with machinations. You provide them with cover to sell us a free lunch. Then all that we're left with is debt and a bunch. If you're living high on that cheap credit hog, don't look for a cure from the hair of the dog. Real savings come first if you want to invest. The market coordinates time with interest. Your focus on spending is pushing on thread. In the long run, my friend, it's your theory that's dead. So sorry there, buddy, if that sounds like infective. Prepare to get schooled in my Austrian perspective. We've been going back. For a century, I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. Play more interest nah, rates. It's the animal spirit. spirit. The place you should study isn't the bust. It's the boom that should make you feel leery. That's the thrust of my theory. The capital structure is key. Malinvestments wreck the economy. With an expansion of credit. The Fed sets rates low. Are you starting to get it? That new money is confused for real loanable funds. But it's just inflation that's driving the ones who invest in new projects like housing construction. Plant the seed for its future destruction. The savings aren't real. Consumption's up too. And the grasping reveals there's too few. So the boom turns to bust as the interest rates rise. And for the cost of production, price signals were lies. The boom was a binge. That's a matter of fact. Now with devalued capital that makes up the slack. Whether it's the late 20s or 2005, booming bad investments seems like they thrive. You must save to invest. No reason to predict this, or a bust will surely follow. An economy depressed. Your so-called stimulus will make things worse. Just more of the same, more incentives perverse. And that credit crunch ain't a liquidity trap. Just a broke banking system. I'm done. That's a wrap. We've been going back. For a century, I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. Play more interest nah, rates. It's the animal spirit. The ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else.
practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine that they can desire. Those, those glasses are really paying off, man. Those things are really paying off. I mean, I wish I had a pair yesterday. Now I really wish I had a pair, really. <laughs> I, I like also, if anybody can, you know, if you can pin it to Zach here, you know, it's also like with the shades in the back. I mean, it's looking very 80-ish, right? Like right out of an 80s movie. Like, I, I'm sure I'm giving you guys all a reference to a movie that you've never seen, but it, it's actually, it might be Tom Cruise's first movie, Risky Business. You ever seen this movie? <laughs> You, you're, you might all be familiar with the, the, the scene of Tom Cruise dancing in his underwear and his socks. Anyway, right. Zach, you got it going on, man. You got it going on. Right. <laughs> so anyway, right. I mean, that, that, that kind of captures this debate here that's gone on in the economics profession um, for a long time. And like I said, we're going to continue talking about this debate next week as we continue to talk about economic policy. Right, because this debate about kind of the more liberal or activist view of government against the kind of conservative and more skeptical view, right, that, that economists imagine that they can do a lot of things, but what can they actually achieve? I think that's another question. So anyway, we, we will return to this, this whole debate next week. Now, in the last few minutes that we have in class here, we spent our entire class talking about one kind of recession the aggregate demand dr driven recession. But we need to talk about, if you remember at the beginning of class, I said there was a second type of a recession. And you probably won't be surprised to find out that it's the ag aggregate supply driven recession. This is a recession that's not driven by a change in aggregate demand, but it's driven by a change in aggregate supply. This kind of recession, thankfully, is much less common. The classic example in US history of when we had an aggregate supply driven recession was the 1970s. So in the 1970s, the U.S. went through a, a series of oil price shocks. Right. A series of oil price shocks. So uh, what the first shock uh, was the Arab-Israeli war in 1971. The 1974 was the OPEC oil embargo. In 1979 was the Iranian Revolution. And so basically the price of oil doubled at each of these points in time. The important thing to note here though, was that we had a much more energy and oil dependent economy back then than we do today, right? I mean, I have clear and fond memories of the joy of driving in cars back in the mid 1970s. Our car was as big as this basement right? We used to, first off, we never wore seatbelts because, you know, why would you wear a seatbelt? Our car, we just had a sedan, but our car was so big that I could stick my little sister up in the back window and she could lay down and fall asleep there, right? Actually, I could jam both of my little sisters up in the window, right? Our cars were huge. Our equipment was oil intensive, right? Everything that we did was very oil dependent, in 1975, we used about two times, I'm, I'm sorry, five times as much oil per dollar of GDP as we do today, right? And so these oil price shocks were big increases in the price of inputs. 
This increased the price of making almost everything. It increased the price of making almost everything. And so what then happened in the economy? So I'm gonna draw a graph a little different here. I'm gonna, in the interest of, of clarity, let's just leave long run aggregate supply off of this, okay? I'm just gonna leave the long run aggregate supply curve off of this, but let's think about an econ economy with just short run aggregate supply and we begin at the natural rate. What then happens when we have this big increase in the price of oil? It reduces short run aggregate supply because an increase in the price of an input is a reduction in supply. Remember, a, a reduction in supply is a move to the left. What happens? Output falls. But here's something different. Not only does output fall, mean, meaning not only does output fall so that we have a recession, but something else happens. The price level goes up and we begin to get inflation. Which is not typical, right? I mean, when, we, when we've thought about aggregate demand driven recessions, when aggregate demand falls, that reduces output, but it actually reduces inflation. Here, we really got the worst of both worlds. We had a fall in output and a rise in inflation, which became commonly known at the time as stagflation, meaning stagnant output growth and inflation at the same time, kind of, kind of the worst of all possible worlds. And remember, this didn't just happen one time, this happened three times. Three times we had this fairly significant recession also associated with higher inflation. How should the government respond? I'd like to hear your ideas about this one. What, what, how, how should the government have responded to this? Any ideas? Would we do the opposite of the demand, like lower government spending? So you mean try to reduce aggregate demand? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll consider that that first. And, and first off, why would we want to reduce aggregate demand? Maybe to reduce inflation, right? Let's go up to our graph here. Notice that inflation is a problem. So we could reduce aggregate demand and reduce inflation. Of course, what's the problem with that? What's going to happen to our recession? It's going to make the recession worse, right? Um, people in the federal government at the time said, nope, not going to do that. <laughs> Let's do the opposite. Let's increase aggregate demand to increase output. 
So let me let me recreate my my graph here. So aggregate demand fell. Oh, gosh dang, what am I doing? Okay, start this again. Short where an aggregate supply fell. And we go into recession. And inflation goes up. <clears throat> So the, uh, what's the response? Well, particularly what the Fed did was the Fed said, we don't want a recession. What are we gonna do? We are going to stimulate aggregate demand. Right, we are going to try to use aggregate demand to drive output back up. Of course, what's the problem with that? It makes the inflation problem worse. And this is where we got the high inflation of the 1970s. By 1980, our inflation rate was roughly about 18% a year, depending upon how you measure it, 18% a year. So you can see it here in the data. Sorry, what am I looking at, right? So here you see what happened to the price level, the green line, but the purple line is the one we're most interested in inflation. Look at inflation take off during the 1970s, right? So inflation basically spiked and you, you can kind of see the spikes here that kind of correspond both with the oil price shocks that would increased inflation, but then with Fed policy, which increased inflation. The Fed considers this to be one of its biggest mistakes. This was most likely a mistake in policy. And as we're going to talk about later, in 1981, they basically had to do a costly power policy reversal. Can you can you switch back to your iPad? Sorry. Hello, where are you? There it is. Right. So this was a, pol a costly policy mistake where they let inflation get out of control. And basically what happened then in 1981 was the Fed had to do a costly policy reversal. They significantly reduced aggregate demand to reduce inflation. But what was the cost? A big recession. The Fed basically purposely ran a recession in 1981 because it was the only way that they could reduce inflation. So this was a big mistake. Supply shocks are not great situations, right? Because there's really no good options for policymakers. But what the Fed did in the 1970s, it never wants to repeat again. <laughs> and, and, and 
that's important to keep in mind here in a second when we, we talk about the, the COVID recession, right? And the COVID, the COVID economy today, because the Fed has this in the back of its mind. Are we gonna repeat this mistake? Are we gonna repeat this mistake of basically getting so focused on output that we let inflation get out of control? And so this was a, this was a big mistake in the 1980s. And, and um, this was a very costly recession. Right. So while overall, you know, overall, one of the things that we've seen here is that recessions are not as bad today as they used to be. Right. Oftentimes, economists call this the great moderation. And what's the great moderation? Um, the great moderation is that unemployment and output is not as volatile, volatile as it used to be. We are having fewer recessions than we used to have. You see here the Great Depression and COVID notwithstanding, output has actually been more stable um, in recent years. Partly that's government policy, right? Partly that's, that's effective government policy. But that doesn't mean that the Fed has not made mistakes. Right, and the 1970 mistakes were a big one, right? Were a big one. So let, let's spend the last couple of minutes here um, because I do want to let you go. We're getting at 11 o'clock, but also we're not going to have class this afternoon. So this is this is the price you pay. This is your your tariff for not having class. Let's talk a little bit about the COVID economy. Obviously, we had a pretty big fall in output in 2020. We had a recession. All right, who wants me to help me with this? Was this a demand-driven recession or a supply-driven recession? What do you think? Is it possible to be both a little bit? Because like it was hard to get raw materials for a lot of things this year to like make stuff, but also people were scared. Yeah, right. So no, I actually, I do, I do agree with you, Logan, that I, th I think it was a little bit of both. However, I'm gonna argue that of the two, the most important was the demand part of it, right? I think particularly at the beginning of the recession, there were big worries that there was gonna be big falls in aggregate supply, right? Why? Because businesses had to close. Workers couldn't, or businesses couldn't find workers at the beginning, you remember there were all those shutdowns. Um, supply chains all these broken global supply chains I should say all of these things increase the cost of business and reduced aggregate supply but I think particularly given hindsight we can see much more clearly that at least until this point, it's not been the supply stuff that's driven most of what's gone on in the economy. It's been the demand stuff. Right? The, the fear factor, the psychology of this, that people have been afraid to go out. They have not traveled. You know, I mean, I shouldn't I should say it's only fear, but I mean, there's also been some legitimate restrictions. There have been some legitimate restrictions on behavior, and of course, those have, re have limited people's ability to spend in ways that they'd want. How do I know that aggregate demand has fallen more than aggregate supply? How do I know that? In this if you look at 
Yeah, go ahead, Zach. What were you going to say? No, no, it's... <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. I was thinking about, like, the chip shortage that we had, and I don't know. I was just probably not going to... It's best if I don't talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you a hint here. Both of these reduced output, right? Both of these have served to reduce output. But where have they had a different effect? Bryn, you got to calm your roommate down because she's becoming a distraction. <laughs> Sorry, she is um, just a little bit too out of <laughs> All right. So we know that both of them are reducing output, right? But what about their Im impact on inflation? The fall in aggregate supply should increase inflation, but the fall in aggregate demand should decrease inflation. What have we actually seen happen to inflation during, during the COVID period? Inflation's fallen. Right now, that's just starting to change now. But in general, we've seen inflation go down. That's how I know that the fall in aggregate demand has been bigger than the fall in aggregate supply. That and just simple observation. Then, in general, we have not had shortages of goods, though there have been certain out there. I mean, in certain goods, there have been shortages. But surpluses have been the bigger factor, right? Surpluses. That, that, and that suggests that it's demand that's the primary cause of what's happened, not supply. I didn't do a good job of drawing my blue line here. I really shouldn't have got it so fat here. <laughs> to make it more clear that uh, the fall in supply has been not nearly as big as the fall in aggregate demand. To me, all, I mean, of course, evidence is still coming in and I'm open to changing my mind about this as I change, as I get more evidence, right? But to me, the bulk of the evidence suggests that this has primarily been an aggregate demand driven recession. Some, Fall in aggregate supply, certainly, but it's been primarily a fall in aggregate demand. Now, I think the question, and this is really going to lead us to where we talk about on Monday, when we talk about government policy, is what happens now? It's pretty clear that aggregate demand in the U.S. economy is recovering quickly. Confidence is returning as we have more and more vaccinated people and people are feeling like they can go out and they can work, they can spend. But there's also been big stimulus from the US government that has increased aggregate demand, right? The U.S. government has had a couple of big stimulus packages, and they're talking, President Biden's talking about more stimulus. So if I can try to draw a graph here of what's going on in the economy. I might draw it like this. That first we had a big fall in aggregate demand and a little fall in aggregate supply. Right. And so where are we? We fell well below the natural rate and the price level actually fell from where we started. Okay, that's, that's there, here, here was where we were in, you know, let's say, the summer 
of 2020. Everybody with me? I apologize that this graph is just a little complicated, but that's, that's probably where we were in the summer of 2020. Big fall in aggregate demand, a little fall in aggregate supply. Now, let me do today in red. What's happening today? Well, today we've had a lot, a big bounce back in aggregate demand, right? A big bounce back in aggregate demand. But there are still some su supply consequences here to be worried about, particularly in certain industries. So as aggregate demand recovers and the output goes up, there is a worry, and the Federal Reserve in particular is worried about this, that aggregate supply is falling. And what could that pretend? Higher inflation. So while output appears to be a lot better, this recovery in aggregate demand and the continually continual problems in aggregate supply might mean for more inflation. So we have a stronger economy. But are we looking at more inflation in the future? This is what the Federal Reserve is asking itself, and this is what markets are asking themselves. Okay? Okay, you guys are starting to become economists, <laughs> right? If you understood this little discussion, you're starting to think like an economist, right? Because you can see this stuff is not easy, right? It's not easy. There's a lot going on here. My God, look at that graph, right? It, 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 it looks like graffiti, right? There is a lot going on here, but what makes thinking like an what makes you think like an economist using a model to try to take something that is excruciatingly complex and making it at least a little simpler so that you can kind of understand it right and so that's what i'm trying to do here if i think about you know where we are today in the economy right use this model to help us think through what happened last year and what could be happening this year and that's exactly how economists think, right? That's exactly how economists think. And so, you know, it, it, you know, at this point, it's a good time to pat yourself on the back, right? Yesterday, you didn't know anything about aggregate demand, aggregate supply. Today, hopefully, most of you are, to some extent, drawing graphs like this and saying, yeah, I understood what happened in 2020, and I can think about what's happening in 2021, right? You're starting to get the same intuition that the chairman of the Federal Reserve has, because I'll tell you, the chairman of the Federal Reserve may not have much more intuition than this, right? <laughs> so, you know, so it's an accomplishment, right? It's accomplishment. And, and, it, and hopefully, over the last couple of days, you've seen both why working with models is hard, but why they can be so useful, right? Because working with models is hard, but you know what's harder? Not using models, right? <laughs> not using models forces you to deal with the whole complexity of reality that can really twist your head off, right? And so, yeah, right? That, I, I hope you feel like we've made some good progress here. And so um, that, that your understandings of both how the model works and then today, how you can apply the model to explain real world situations, you know, hopefully that's gotten better. Okay, so we're a little bit over time. I'm gonna let you go. No class this afternoon. This weekend would be a great time to catch up on everything, including chapter 12, right? Including chapter 12, to review some of this and make sure that, you, that you're on the same page. Um, if any of you would like to talk with me today, I have just a couple of minutes after class. You can also send me an email and there might be, a, I, I do have a few breaks in my afternoon that we can meet through office hours. Also, I'll let you all know that Monday, is probably not as busy day for us. And so we'll also have a little bit of time to review through everything Monday afternoon. 
Um, in fact, I was kind of thinking about Monday afternoon as more kind of just a, a voluntary review session. Let, let's see how far we get through through in Monday morning, but maybe the kind of think about most of the afternoon is that. So, um, but anyway, this is this is a, a great weekend and a, and a well placed weekend to kind of get caught up on everything and, and really um, try to solidify your understanding of all this because it will be important for what we talk about next week. Okay, all right, any, any last questions before I let you all go? All right, well, thank you so much for your attention this week, your hard work this week. Have a good weekend. Bryn, watch out for that roommate. Tie her up, give her some quaaludes or something, calm her down. <laughs> She's still back to you, watch out, she's coming for you. She's gonna eat your neck. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. See everybody. <laughs> I, have a, I, have a, I have a quick question. I didn't want to bring it up in class because I didn't know if it was like pertaining to what we were doing. Mm -hmm. But it's this one, one thing I've been hearing is like a lot of people are worried about the, the Federal Reserve like printing money. And like the, you know, someone said, oh, we have like 50% more money circulating now than we did in before COVID or whatever. And it's just like, okay, well, I mean, I get it, but like, does that matter? You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you know what? I'm not going to answer that question right now. <laughs> okay. okay. But on Monday and Tuesday, this is basically what we're taught. Well, actually, is it Monday, Tuesday? No, I'm forgetting my schedule. We are talking a lot about the Federal Reserve next week. Um, yeah, actually, Tuesday and Wednesday, we're going to spend pretty much the whole day talking about the Federal Reserve and monetary policy. Okay. So, so in, hold on to your question. And then, yeah, I think we'll be a lot better poised to talk about it in um, not end of the world terms, like you often hear people <laughs> talk about monetary policy, right? So, but, but just as a little preview, no, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. See ya. Yeah. Take care. Me and uh, Evan want to know when you're getting the sunglasses. <laughs> Are you guys going to make me get sunglasses? <laughs> I think it's required now. <laughs> All right. I am too cheap to, to buy those $70 sunglasses, but you might, you might get me to look on Amazon and see what I can find. <laughs> All right. They're cheaper on Amazon. So, I mean, that might be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> You want me to look, I actually do, I do have to tell you guys, I looked this morning and then I kind of ran out of time, but I was going to put, you know, when I mute my video, there, it just, I don't, it just shows up my, you know, just a, the letter T, I think, but I was going to have it show up a picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger from the Terminator with those damn glasses on, <laughs> 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 which would have been very funny, but then I kind of, I, I kind of got distracted and didn't get around to it, but but maybe this weekend that that will be the two things i'll look and see if i can but the, the, the listen here though the, here's the problem zach my my entire life experience can be summed up in this i'm not cool when i try to act cool <laughs> yeah there's a big danger that it, i'm just gonna look like even more of a dork than i already look like with those glasses no they increase the looks it's a fine demand <laughs> <laughs> All supply and demand, is it? <laughs> oh, yeah. You demand the glasses and you supply a better look. <laughs> I, can't, I can't argue with that. I can't. I mean, that, that is some sound economic logic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm, feel, I'm feeling the peer pressure. I'm feeling the peer pressure. Okay. Let me, let me see what I can do. <laughs> All right. See ya. All right. See you guys. Have a good weekend. <laughs> you too.